We are in a moment very much like the moment uh, during World War I and after. Uh, what is called, this has many names, but the Red Scare. Uh, but there was also an immigration scare. And actually, the, the Red Scare and the immigration scare were very much part of one another because immigrants were tagged as having a, an alien ideology uh, across the board. Uh, and um, it was a time uh, when thousands of Americans were imprisoned for thought crimes. Uh, it, and, and there was a time when the Attorney General, at will, rounded up immigrants and deported them without any due process. Uh, some notorious Scots were sent back uh, to Glasgow. Uh, and um, uh, so it, it was about different groups than the hysteria today, but it, uh, it had a similar character to it. And it was a time of uh, what's called the, the, the second Ku Klux Klan, uh, which uh, grew in importance to the point where it took over Indiana. If one thinks about that period, you know, why was it like that? Well, it was in part the tail end of a big wave of immigration, uh, beginning roughly in 1880 uh, and going through uh, into the teens. Uh, we were a country of, I don't know, 100 million people or so, don't, don't, don't hold me to the statistics exactly, but uh, uh, in 1900, and 20 million people came in. Uh, so it was, a lot of people, it was a big proportion of the country. And actually that wasn't so unusual because from 1860 uh, uh, until 1924, the percentage of foreign born in the United States was typically 13, 14%, which is higher than it is now. Uh, but one of the things that happened over time was that the places from which the immigration came changed. And so Germany initially supplied a lot of the immigrants. Uh, and because of the two world wars in the 20th century, German Americans have kind of kept it quiet that that's what they are. No, no pride parades, no celebration of, of ethnic identity, but there are like 40 million of the American people are, are from German Americans. But then towards the end of the 19th century and into the teens, the Italians came, the Lebanese came, what we would now call Lebanese came, and uh, about 10% of them were Muslim. So it was the first big wave of Muslim immigration to the United States. And the Poles came and the Jews came. And uh, so by the teens, you started to have white Protestants forming militia gangs to patrol their neighborhoods. Uh, one of the reasons we got prohibition was that it was felt that these rowdy Eastern and Southern European immigrants, uh, you know, a lot of them were single males when they came over, and then after work in the factories, they would gather in the saloons and become rowdy, and they would attack the respectable women and so forth. So then there shouldn't be any liquor. In, in the country. So, um, and, and then you, you, you had riots. Uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska had a uh, riot against Greek Americans in 1908. The scare of Eastern Orthodoxy apparently was too much uh, for, for Nebraska. Uh, and um, uh, so, as I said, it seemed to me a very similar kind of era. And then, of course, many of the Eastern European and Southern European immigrants had been socialists in their home countries, and so then they were tagged as pinkos here, and that caused a lot of uh, enmity and, and rancor, and was one of the reasons uh, that they got deported. If they got involved in union activities, for instance, uh, uh, they, they would be targeted by the Department of Justice. Uh, I think we may have to get used to that phrase targeted by the Department of Justice in the next few years. Uh, so, but it wouldn't be anything new. And then in 1924, uh, as a result of this agitation uh, over immigration, leftist ideology, uh, a, a number of issues, Congress passed uh, a, a, a new immigration law. And uh, there were disputes over 
the basis for the immigration law, but it was ultimately based on the proportion of people who were here in 1880, who of course, if you, there was some question that maybe it should be 1890, but no, too many non-white Northern European Protestants had come by then. So it, it was made 1880 was the base. Uh, and so it didn't completely exclude the Italians because some of them had already come, but it had a bias towards Northern European Protestants. Uh, the, the, the Lebanese weren't welcome anymore. I think the, the uh, quota for Lebanon and Syria together was, was 400 a year. And they had country quotas. So they, they let the people know in the world how many of those kinds of people they wanted to come every year. Uh, and so um, uh, I think probably all, the, all of Norway could have come, you know, that would have been all right, but, uh, uh, but not so. No Asians. Asians were completely excluded. Nobody from Thailand, Philippines, Japan. And this broke a treaty that they actually had made with Japan to let a few hundred in every year. Uh, and, um, and, that, and that stayed, and there was a Chinese Exclusion Act, but this was on top of that. It stayed until the 1940s, until Chinese were allowed to come again. And the whole thing only broke down in 1965 as a result of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, in which the country finally became ashamed, because this was more or less a Nazi law. I mean, it was about racial hierarchies. It was very clear, you just have to look at the quotas. Uh, and, um, and so they replaced it with a, a new law that uh, let, uh, actually set a ceiling of 25,000 per country in the world for potential immigration. Of course, the immigrants had to meet certain standards and, and so forth, but uh, the, um, the conservatives in Congress at the time were worried about kind of an open immigration policy of that sort, and they were determined to try to tilt it again towards Northern Europe. Uh, and so they put in a clause uh, that allowed relatives to have special perquisites in bringing people over. And they were expecting that, as immigration had traditionally been predominantly from Europe, that that would continue, and so this would kind of give a bias in the law towards uh, European immigration. But it turns out that Europe was doing just fine in the 60s and 70s, uh, and you know, had a very strong post-war recovery, and people weren't so interested in coming from there anymore. And people mainly came from, about half came from Latin America every year, and people came from Europe, and um, uh, from, uh, from Asia. And uh, so that uh, clause that allowed relatives to have uh, a special perquisites became available for chain migration from Latin America and Asia. So it backfired on the conservatives in Congress. And that's how we get Muslims in the United States, because as of 1965, the sociologists think there were only about 100,000 in the country. But since, since 65, if up to 25,000 could come from every country in the world, one of the advantages the Muslims have is, you know, the poor Chinese, they only have like four countries, but the Muslims, they have a lot of countries, uh, 56 Muslim majority countries, plus all the places that they're minority. So they could be, you know, a significant proportion of the people who came in, and moreover, there were push factors, there were trouble, there was Lebanon civil war, there was trouble in Afghanistan, for one reason or another, Southeast Asia had its troubles too, but Muslims were particularly caught up in situations where there was a reason for them to, to, want, to want to leave their homeland beyond just economic aspiration. So I would argue that we're now very much in 2016 where we kind of were in 1916. And we're having the equivalent of a red scare, only now it's a Muslim scare. Uh, and many of the same anxieties are being uh, being expressed, and we're kind of afraid we might be having the third big wave of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a kind of nativism, but it's coming in response to this massive wave of immigration we've had since 65. In recent years, a million people a year have been coming legally to the United States.